गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन सो वी गोइंग टू कंटिन्यू आर लेक्चर सीरीज एवरी वीक दिस सैटरडे विल टैकल रेटिनॉइड्स नाउ आई हैव गॉट अ लॉट ऑफ सजेशन रिगार्डिंग रेटिनॉइड्स अ लॉट ऑफ दिपिया लॉट ऑफ व्यूअर्स वॉन्टेड दे वॉन्टेड टू नो अ बिट more about retinoids and i think uh, the reason is that it's the one of uh, one of the most common classes of drugs that we come across in our daily private practice so i wanted to cover retinoids in a single video but then i realized that they are complicated and we need to know a bit more about each and in each and every retinoids for example i wanted to discuss retinoids separately as retinoids separately as it retin separately and uh, then i realized that there is a lot of uh, overlap in between each and individual retinoids as far as their mechanism of action their side effects are concerned so i thought it's better that if we understand the common mechanisms of actions the common uh, uses of retinoids a common uh, you could say side effects of retinoids and if we are able to easily understand uh, these kind of uh, overlapping uh, areas then it will be easy uh, a lot easier for us to understand each and every retinoid so i won't have to repeat everything uh, again and again while discussing uh, different different drugs so i thought i'll start our series on retinoids by discussing the common aspects as the first video uh, as introduction to retinoids in dermatology and then we'll go forward each and every week discussing one retinoid in detail and understanding this uh, very powerful class of molecules uh, in in a much better way so that we know how uh, when and where to use them when uh, to expect side effects and everything else and what exactly are the areas where we use retinoids we commonly use retinoids for acne and psoriasis these two are the major indications but we also used it in prp we also use it in uh, uh, squamous cell carcinomas bcc's prevention so we'll try to cover everything Uh, while uh, while discussing the common aspects of each retinoid and then sequentially we'll move forward and discuss different different retinoids separately and in detail so without further ado we'll start the discussion on introduction to retinoids in dermatology so what exactly are retinoids Retinoids are all synthetic and natural compounds with biological activity like that of vitamin A. Now, vitamin A is also known as retinol. Okay. And if there are certain um, certain class of molecules which function like retinol, you call them as retinoids. Okay, retinoids. and do, 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 that is what exactly retinoids is these are certain compounds they can be natural or synthetic but their biological activity is like that of vitamin a okay now initially uh, many many decades ago it was found that patients suffering from vitamin a deficiency had epidermal hyperkeratosis squamous metaplasia of mucous membranes various keratinization disorders and certain precancerous conditions okay so from these observations was found that vitamin a is a very essential molecule for proper keratinization process to take over so that proper epidermal turnover is maintained if if uh, the body has the prerequisite amounts of vitamin a so vitamin a deficiency can lead to disorders of epidermal turnover epidermal sorry epidermal keratinization it may even lead to certain precancerous conditions that is why vitamin a is very important the only issue with vitamin a or let's say the major issue with vitamin a was its narrow therapeutic index for example uh, what do we mean by therapeutic index that means it is that interval of doses in which you have the least side effects with the maximum efficacy okay the maximum action but the least side effect now uh, what do we mean by that that means it is very easy because this therapeutic index is very narrow it is very easy to go outside this therapeutic index that means either you will have very low efficacy at lower doses or you will have very high chances of side effects so subsequently after establishing the crucial role of vitamin a in epidermal turnover uh, the research started to create synthetic molecules which will have a broader therapeutic index so that they are safer to use in patients okay 
So the first use of retinoids was in 1943 by Stromfeld for acne vulgaris. So retinoids initially started as a therapy for a, a systemic therapy against acne. Tretinoin was also used for acne first, but then eventually it was found to be beneficial in acute promyositic leukemia. Okay. So even in, even in current time, we do use retinoids as treatment of leukemia. It is a, it is a known treatment for myelocytic leukemia, promyelocytic leukemia. It is, uh, it is a part of all the anti-leukemic regimens. In 1962, Sturgeon started using topical retinoin. This is the first time where topical therapy was started. Initially, it was only systemic. Okay. Initially, the retinoids were systemic agents, but now they are topical. And Sturgeon used topical retinoid in keratinization disorders like ichthyosis, PRP, and actinic keratosis. So that is how now, now we have systemic uh, retinoids and topical retinoids. Kligman, the famous, famous Kligman, in 1969, started using topical retinoid for acne vulgaris. Okay. Isotretinoin received FD approval in 1962 for nodulocystic acne of the severe variety. Okay. Let me write it again. Yeah. So nodulocystic of the severe variety. So that nowadays we use, uh, or at least majority of us use isotretinoin for nearly any sort of acne. But it was given FD approval for severe nodulocystic acne, severe and recalcitrant, not responding to other therapy. But for most of us, retinoids are the first uh, Drug of drug of choice are so the first drug we use for uh, treating acne. Subsequently, aromatic retinoids were manufactured, which were very helpful in treating psoriasis. Okay, so isotretinoin has, has a long chain. We'll, I'll tell you about the structure of isotretinoin in uh, subsequent slides. And in aromatic retinoids, you have further ring elements added to the structure and changing the chemical properties so they are better suited for psoriasis that is why you don't use acetretin for acne you don't use isotretinoin for psoriasis because they have different kind of efficacies because of their different structures in order to understand what uh, what actually retinoids do in our body we need to understand what uh, what is the function of vitamin a or how the, how do the body absorbs transports, stores vitamin A, okay? So vitamin A cannot be synthesized by the body. It cannot be synthesized. It has to be obtained from outside. It is obtained through animal and plant sources, okay? Carotenoids. Carotenoids are precursor molecules mostly found in plants where they have a photosensitive role. That means similar to like we have chlorophyll for the green color, we have carotenoids for the red or orange color, okay? Now, when animals will eat these plants, these carotenoids will get oxidized to retinol or vitamin A in animals. So, that is how we get our vitamin A source. If we eat orange and red vegetables and fruits, we will get carotene. Or if any other animal eats carotenoids a rich food, convert it into vitamin A and store it in their liver. So, when we eat the liver parts or other areas of storage of vitamin A, we get vitamin A from animal sources, okay? Each carotene molecule gives rise to two times retinol in the intestines, okay? So for example, one molecule of carotene or one molecule of, you could say, beta carotene, beta carotene gives rise to two molecules of retinol, okay? Now, retinol or vitamin A is your central molecule. If we oxidize retinol, we get retinal. So, retinol... Retinol is an alcoholic compound. Okay, it has an OH group, hydroxyl group. Retinal is aldehyde. AL, aldehyde. Like ethanol, ethanol. We have retinol, retinal. This reaction, this conversion of retinol to retinal is reversible. It can go both ways. Retinol can also be further oxidized to retinoic acid. Okay, and this oxidation is irreversible. That means once converted to RA, it does not go back to retinol. Retinal can also get oxidized to retinoic acid. So, retinoic acid is the end stage oxidized compound. And retinoic acid is the functional element. That means the biological functions are carried out by the retinoic acid. So, we absorb 
molecules as retinol, convert it into retinoic acid and then utilize it for biological functions. Now retinol or the 11-cis isomer or 11-trans isomer of retinol is very important for visual process. And we should go and read about rhodopsin or if you remember a bit about a physiology, you will understand how vitamin A is important and why its deficiency then causes nyctalopia or night blindness. Okay. Now, it is very important for visual process, very important for epidermal differentiation. And uh, epidermal dis uh, differentiation is important through retinal and also through retinoic acid. So, both of them work towards epidermal differentiation. Keratins can also act as antioxidants, we all know that. So, that can uh, that is an additional function of vitamin A or carotenoids. Now, this is the structure of beta carotene. Here we have beta carotene molecule. And if you look closely, the difference between the structure of retinol and beta carotene is that that if you have this have a uh, have a division at this level where you have that purple line, it, it will give you two different molecules of retinol. Can you see the structural similarity? You have the ring here, two rings here. If you break the molecule in between, you will get two molecules of retinol. So that's what we meant when we said that one keratin gives rise to two molecules of retinol. Okay, now pharmacology. The bioavailability of retinols are increased with food and fatty meal. Why? Because vitamin A is a fat-soluble vitamin. Okay, fat-soluble vitamin. Other vitamins include uh, A, D, E, K, edic. So vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin K are fat soluble. So they are better absorbed while uh, while we uh, sorry they are better absorbed when we eat them with a, a fatty meal. Although it is not technically recommended, we don't want to increase the cholesterol levels of the patient. So it's better that you ask them to take it with meal, take it with food. Now when we ingest vitamin A or retinoids. They are absorbed by enterocytes. Enterocytes are your cells of the intestinal villi. Okay. In the intestinal villi, we have CRBP or cytosolic retinol binding protein 2 in, in small intestine. In, and through these receptors, or you could say through this uh, action of enterocytes, we absorb vitamin A mixed in a chylomicron. Now, what is chylomicron? It's a bilipid structure. And this chylomicron has lipid inside. Okay, this is lipid. Lipid. And vitamin A is fat soluble, so it will also be inside. Vitamin A will be inside. And this hole is chylomicron. And this chylomicron is absorbed via enterocyte. And when it goes inside enterocyte, the CRBP2 is responsible for attaching itself to retinoids and securing it. Okay. Now, after securing the in, inside the enterocytes, the molecule is transferred to the serum and in the serum, by the action of transtheratin and retinol binding proteins, it is transported from intestine to liver where it is stored and the storage takes place by using CRVP1. This is 1. Okay, so cytosolic retinol binding protein 1. And here in liver is where most of the vitamin A of the body is stored. That that uh, that organ acts as a store of vitamin A. That is why cod liver fish uh, oil is very rich in vitamin A because that is where vitamin A is stored. Other storage areas are from adipose storage, for example, in uh, fat, where we know that adretinate is 50 times more soluble than acetretin. And this... This point is very important when we'll discuss why a person should not take alcohol while taking acetretin. It's a very interesting and important point. We'll touch very briefly in this video. We'll touch it in detail while discussing acetretin. Some amount of retinoids do get secreted in breast milk, but roughly about 20, less than 20%. And infants might have 1.5 times the maternal doses because of accumulation in the infants. That is why lactation is prohibited. So it is not to be given in pregnancy and lactation. Retinoids are not given during that time. So how do we classify retinoids? 
we know that there are three classes of retinoids, one, two, three, but technically now there, there are four classes of retinoids, okay? So the first class has a polyene and a polar end manipulation. What do we mean by that? Remember that retinol has a ring at one end and then a polyene at the other end. Polyenes means a long chain with multiple double bonds. This chain is known as ene. This is the same same concept as amphotericin B, if, if you remember that video. So, if there is, uh, and this is the polar end here, this is the polar end, okay? So, if there's any manipulation of the chain or of the polar end, you have the class 1 uh, retinoids, which includes tretinoin, which is a trans retinoic acid. So, T for tretinoin, T for trans retinoic acid. Or you have isotretinoin, cis, see, cis has is cis so for is it is isotretinoin okay so cis retinoic acid is isotretinoin all trans retinoic acid is tretinoin okay this is the first class of retinoids the second class is known as monoaromatic that means vitamin a ring are replaced by other ring system this ring this ring is replaced by other ring systems and the second class includes acetretin and atretinate so now you have better ring systems and these are known as aromatic retinoids or monoaromatic because only one ring is added and they are better for psoriasis. The third one has polyaromatic because there are multiple rings attached to the chain now and they form the third generation of retinoids and this includes bexarotene and elytretinoin. Bexarotene is a very important molecule for CTCL cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. So these are the three classes of retinoids. The fourth class is a selective RAR gamma agonist. We'll discuss the individual receptors in subsequent slide. And the fourth class contains one, uh, one drug, which is a selective RAR gamma receptor agonist. And the name of the drug is triferrotene. Triferrotene is the latest FDA-approved retinoid for acne. Okay. So we are clear about it. Now we know the four classes of uh, four classes of retinoids. So transportation. So we have discussed the classification of retinoids. We have discussed how the body absorbs chylomicrons, which has retinoids. Now what? Now what happens to retinoid? The, re the retinol, which was absorbed by the small intestine enterocytes, go into circulation. That means inside the bloodstream or serum. Retinoids are transported in serum in the form of atra. Atra is all trans retinoic acid or tretinoin. Tretinoin, okay? More than the 13 cis form. 13 cis is isotretinoin, IST, isotretinoin, okay? So majorly the transportation, uh, transportation happens in, in ATRA form, atra form, okay? The retinoids are transported by pre-albumin. These are protein molecules which will bind retinoid and retinol binding proteins. These are specialized protein molecules which bind themselves to retinoids. Okay. Retinol and retinol binding protein are known as holoprotein. And this holoprotein binds to transtheratin, which is also pre-albumin, for further stabilization. Okay, so what I'm trying to say, let's see you have a molecule of retinol here. Okay, this retinol will attach itself to a retinol binding protein. So this green color is retinol binding protein. And this retinol binding protein will further attach, will further attach to this blue structure which is trans- Theratin. Let me write it in short form. TYT. Okay. So this blue one is trans -theratin. Clear? And this whole complex is then transported inside through the bloodstream. Transported through the bloodstream. Okay. And the well, this, let me just write it again. Retinol binding protein plus retinoids are known as holoprotein. Holoprotein. Okay. So holoprotein plus trans is the transportation uh, transportation molecule for retinoids when these retinoids or these transportation molecules which is liver it is stored as retinyl ester that means you have esterification of retinols 
as uh, from retinol to retinal esters and then they are stored inside the liver. We have storage proteins like cytosolic retinoic acid binding protein. Now remember in enterocytes, in intestine, it was CRBP, cytosolic retinol binding protein. But now we have cytosolic retinoic acid binding protein 1 and 2. And these are responsible for, for, for sequestering retinoids and transporting it towards the nucleus. Okay, so what happens, just look here. You have a cell membrane, cell membrane, and you have CRABP2. This molecule is responsible of, tra of transporting the retinoids which are absorbed by the cell to the nucleus. And here, the retinoid acid molecules will bind to the genetic material, leading to transcription of important molecules. Okay, and the concentration of CRABP is about 8 times in psoriatic skin lesion. That is why psoriasis responds well to retinoids because this kind of transportation molecule which carries retinoids to cell membrane, sorry, from cell membranes to the nucleus of the cell is 8 times higher in the, uh, in the psoriatic lesion. Okay, and CRABP2, the CRABP2 is very, very high in skin. And it becomes further increased in concentration in psoriasis. Okay. So now uh, we we know how retinoids are going to reach the nucleus. We'll discuss a bit about the different membrane uh, membrane receptors that we have. Now retinoid receptors are uh, they belong to steroid hormone family and the steroid hormone family. Other receptors are vitamin D, thyroid hormone. Okay, corticosteroid receptors. This is a large family and one of those is uh, retinoid receptors. There are essentially two different types of retinoid receptors. You have RAR and RXR receptors. Okay, so you have RAR. R X R. Okay. R A R can further be divided uh, has different subtypes, alpha beta gamma. R X R also has alpha beta gamma and RA gamma agonist is triferritin the fourth generation retinoids okay now RAR is always paired with RXR so what do we mean by that RAR cannot exist individually it has to be always paired with RXR in other words you have RAR and XR com not complex this is known as a heterodimer RAR cannot exist as a homodimer. You cannot have two RAR molecules attached. You always have RAR and RXR. Okay. However, RXR can attach itself to form a homodimer. Homodimer. So that's the difference between RAR and RXR. Furthermore, RXR can also attach to other receptors. And these other receptors include vitamin D3, thyroid receptors, PPAR, gamma. Okay, so these are other receptors which can also form complexes with RXR. That's the difference between these two receptors. Now, these RXR, RAR, heterodimer are DNA binding proteins. That means after the uh, after the action of uh, retinoids to on the cell membrane, they get absorbed inside the cells. They are, they are then transported by CRABP2 in, towards the nuclear membrane and where they attach themselves to the genetic uh, material or genetic component and it kind of um, increases the transcription or in many ways decreases the transcription also of various inflammatory molecules. So it can also increase, it can also decrease various genetic transcription molecules and that is how retinoids are able to have that certain physiological effects. Now there are certain areas on the genetic material known as retinoic acid response elements. These are the binding sites of that of for retinoids. These are present on gene and they are responsible for transcription of genes for growth and regulation. What do we mean by that? That means retinoids goes to cell membrane, absorbed, captured by CRABP2, 
then gradually taken towards nuclear membrane. Inside the nucleus, they attach itself on the RARE areas of gene. And after attaching on those areas, they lead to promotion of transcription of some uh, genetic material to form certain proteins, which are responsible for growth and regulation. RAR, RXR receptor complex are also known, or oh, sorry, retinoic acid and RAR receptor complex are also known to antagonize other proteins. For example, activating protein 1, this is responsible for apoptosis. So, retinoic acid along with their receptors can cause apoptosis also. They can also prevent apoptosis. Now, how it is that? All the cells which are not dividing properly, retinoids will lead to apoptosis. For example, these actions become very important in malignancies. So, when you have altered dividing cells, for example, in CTCL, you use retinoids and that's how they help. Okay, but if you want the normalization of epidermal turnover, like in psoriasis, you need to decrease the proliferation of inflammatory cells while increasing the keratinocyte proliferation. And these are those keratinocytes which are normal. They are not psoriatic keratinocytes. So that eventually the skin normalizes. Okay. There are further subtypes also, for example, RAR gamma is present in epidermis and they are responsible for barrier function and epidermal differentiation. RAR beta is, uh, is found in dermal fibroblasts and they are responsible for collagen formation. RAR alpha is found in embryonic skin. They are responsible for cell growth and differentiation, decreased expression of ATRA synthesis enzymes and retinoid target genes. So this last point acts as a negative feedback. It's like a control over the action of retinoids so that no retinoids acts very uh, out of the order. order okay. So they, as, a, as a negative feedback, you have RAR alpha activity. What am I writing? Yeah. Negative feedback. Okay, so these these are the uh, these are some uh, points about retinoid receptors and their subsequent subtypes. Now, what are rexinoids? Rexinoids are those ligands which attach themselves to RXR only, no RAR. So, RXR specific ligands are known as rexinoids. So, just remember this word. Okay. So these are the various receptors, RA, sorry, uh, yeah, RAR and RXR, RAR and RXR, and alpha, beta, gamma subtype, alpha, beta, gamma subtype, and we can see that there is there are different efficacies. For example, ATRA is activated mostly on RAR, not on RXR. Ali twenty nine is activated on all. Let me just use different thing yeah <laughs> so tretinoin is activated both on rar alu tretinoin is activating all six subtypes isotretinoin has no preferably affinity for any subtype same as acetretin bexarotene has more rxr activity just remember that bexarotene has x in there that is why majorly rxr is activated okay Adaptin is, is uh, somewhat RAR beta and gamma. Tazarotene is also beta and gamma. So these are the different subtypes, uh, not subtypes, but affinity for different subtypes of retinoic acid. Okay, let's move forward. So in the subsequent slide, because this slide shows what all molecules or what all processes are decreased by retinoids. So I'm going to summarize all the mechanism of action of retinoids, uh, what all processes are subdued or decreased by retinoids. For example, number one, retinoids decrease tyrosinase activity, they decrease melanin granules, they decrease melanosome formation. That is how they improve pigmentation. That's why I use them in, you know, uh, pigmentary disorders. Okay. Second. Retinoids inhibit UVR-induced C-gen expression. Now, UVR or UV radiation-induced C-gen expression is responsible for 
collagen destruction. So when this C-gen expression is inhibited by retinoids, you have collagen synthesis. That is how retinoids lead to increase collagenization. And this leads to good skin texture and improvement in skin fragility. That's how retinoids act as, an, as a uh, you know, slow aging mechanism. Okay. The third point is that they inhibit UV induced AP1 binding to DNA. And this leads to decrease in matrix metalloproteinases. Matrix metalloproteinases are responsible for destroying collagen. So when these are decreased, you have increased collagen. Okay, you have increased collagenization. Retinoids uh, inhibit proteolytic enzymes by neutrophils, and this acts as an anti inflammatory anti-inflammatory action by decreasing the proteolytic enzymes of neutrophils. Fifth is they decrease the degranulation of phagocytic cells. So whenever, what are phagocytic cells? Any cells which is going to eat bacteria, when they eat bacteria, they will release some cytokines. Those cytokines are responsible for calling other immune cells. So if you decrease the degranulation of phagocytic cells, other immune cells won't be able to reach there. And that is how it acts as an anti-inflammatory. Sixth is it retinoids decrease TNF alpha. We have shown in uh, with the we have shown that graph to you. They decrease TNF alpha and subsequent synthesis of interleukin 1, 6, 8, granulocyte, monocyte, colony stimulating factors, and decreasing these inflammatory cytokines leads to the anti-inflammatory action. Other and other inflammatory molecules like CCN1, interleukin beta, interferon gamma. And okay, interleukin 1 beta, interferon gamma, leukotriene B4, all of these are decreased by retinoids, further adding to the anti inflammatory action. So, here we are discussing about how retinoids improve pigmentation, improve collagenization, and act as anti inflammatory molecules. Let me summarize one is they decrease tyrosine S activity, decrease melanin, decrease melanosomes. They inhibit UV induced damage to pro collagen, so you have more collagen. Okay, increased collagen. Third is they inhibit binding uh, UV induced AP1 synthesis, leading to decreased matrix metalloproteinases. Matrix metalloproteinases are responsible for destroying collagen. If you decrease them, collagen will increase. Okay, uh, collagen will be more. Fourth point is, is they decrease proteolytic en enzymes by neutrophils. They decrease degranulation of phagocytic cells. They decrease TNF alpha interleukin 1, 6, 8, GMCSF. They decrease CCN1 interleukin 1 beta, interferon gamma, leukotriene by 4. And all one of this process is responsible for the anti inflammatory action of retinoids, further helping in disorders like psoriasis. Now, you know why retinoids are very important in psoriasis? This is the reason. So, in the last slide, we studied about what all processes are decreased by retinoids. Now, we'll study about what all processes are increased by retinoids. They increase the epidermal cell turnover, which leads to increased shedding of melanin-laden keratinocytes, and there is improvement in pigmentation. That's how retinoids improve pigmentation. Retinoids can increase prolidase and MRC2 activity which leads to collagen internalization and recycling. That means all the collagen which has been destroyed can be taken back inside, formulated and used again. So this is how this increase collagenization. Okay. Third is increased production of TIMP fibrillin, other dermal molecules, other dermal proteins, collagen. And this is also leading to increased collagenization. Fourth, retinoids increase CD44, hyaluronidate polymerizing enzymes. And these are also responsible for epidermal and dermal intercellular mucin. And this is how they help in aging. Because dermis now has good amount of mucin, filagrin, involucrin, loricrin. These are very important molecules in the process of keratinization. And that is why if retinoids are used in a very low dose, very, very low dose for a longer time, the skin appears to be healthy. The aging process is slowed down because of retinoids. Okay. So these are important molecules in keratinization. 
Fifth is retinoids increase cutaneous blood flow, they modulate angiogenesis, they increase dermal fibroblasts. These are all processes which improve aging. Okay, there's no such thing as anti-aging mechanism, but slowing of aging can be there. There are some additional mechanism of action. We'll discuss mechanism of action in very very detail. Just remember that uh, uh, after see we have gone we have gone through the various mechanisms of action. The further few extra points are that PPR gamma receptors activation through retinoic acid is responsible for prevention of apoptosis. Okay, the cells which are rapidly dying, retinoic acid prevents that. The STRS6, that means stimulated by retinoic acid, that's the full form of STRS6, stimulated by retinoic acid 6, is responsible for gene transcription. So, stimulation of STRA6 is responsible for gene transcription so that newer genes are formulated for various physiological functions. The presence of multiple double bond in vitamin A stored in epidermis protects from sun damage. So, remember, whenever you have genetic material, and UV light falls on it, it leads to breakage of the double bond. And when double bonds are broken, this will lead to what? Mutations or immunosuppression, depending on how you're looking at it. Mutations. Okay. What happens if you have higher stores of vitamin A in the skin cells? Vitamin A has a lot of double bonds. Remember the structure? You have a ring structure and a polyene chain and polyene has multiple double bonds. What happens is that these double bonds will take energy from UV light and break instead of breaking the genetic material. So they act as our shield and protects us from sun damage. That is the mechanism of action of prevention of UV induced damage by using vitamin A. Now, uh, remember that retinoids are responsible for uh, decreasing the epidermal cell turnover in psoriasis or uh, clearing off of the follicular sequestered epithelium in acne or clearing off uh, of increased sebum production in seborrhea. These are the known mechanisms of retinoids. There are other anti-inflammatory mechanisms. For example, there is inhibition of nitric oxide transduction pathway. We remember from our immunity classes that nitric oxide is very responsible. Uh, sorry, it's, it's very important for nitrogen outburst. What is nitrogen outburst? You have a neutrophil. Okay, you have a neutrophil. It has nitrogen ox nitric oxide and this is responsible for creating reactive nitrogen species which will cause damage to the bacteria. Okay, which will cause damage to the bacteria. So, it is very important. Okay, this NO is also important because it stimulates macrophages and monocytes to secrete inflammatory cells sorry, inflammatory molecules. And these inflammatory molecules include TNF-alpha, interleukin-6, interleukin-8, etc. Okay. Now, these inflammatory molecules are responsible for calling other immune cells and attack the bacteria. That is the primary function of any immunity. When these are blocked by retinoids, I have told you that nitric oxide is blocked by retinoids this whole immuno cascade is also blocked. There are no inflammatory cytokines. So, inhibition of nitric oxide leads to inhibition of TNF-alpha, interleukin-6, interleukin-8 and further chemotaxis of T-cells and that is how retinoids act as immuno, not suppressants, predominant immunomodulators or anti-inflammatory agents. They also stabilize epidermal Langerhans cell populations. So that is also that over, over antigen pre, uh, presentation to uh, other immune cells is also taken care of by retinoids. So in this diagram, you can see, let me just remove the written part. Yeah, so in diagram you can see that with increasing concentration of isotretinoin, we have decreasing levels of TNF-alpha as the doses or the concentration, the serum concentration increases of isotretinoin, you have decreasing TNF-alpha and that is how they act as anti-inflammatory. Embryogenesis. Now, why embryogenesis? Uh, 
see, we know that retinoids are category X pregnancy compounds. Okay, you cannot give them in pregnancy. So that's they are category X. The newer category says that they are contraindicated because they have effects on embryogenesis. How? RAR and RXR heterodimer is responsible for signal transduction for growth and organogenesis. Okay, so what happens when these heterodimer are overstimulated by ingestion of retinoids? If you ingest a lot of retinoids during pregnancy or even a little bit of uh, retinoids during pregnancy, there is increased stimulation of RAR and RXR heterodimer leading to abnormal signals for growth. Okay. Abnormal signals for growth. Clear? So that is, if these signals are abnormal, you have embryo toxicity, which in retinoid is known as retinoid embryopathy. Embryopathy. Okay, retinoid embryopathy. What exactly is retinoid embryopathy? We'll discuss when we are discussing these side effects. RAR alpha subtype is responsible for cardiac and ocular morphogenesis. So, if that is overstimulated, you will have problems in heart and eye. RAR gamma is responsible for growth signals and homeobox genes, which are responsible for organogenesis. So, overstimulation of these different subtypes and receptors leads to the embryological deformities, which are collectively known as retinoid embryopathy. Okay. So, in this in this picture, we'll see, uh, we'll revise what actually happens to retinoids when we ingest them and how they reach the target cell. So, in diet, retinal ester, keratins, retinol, they are all converted to retinol in the intestine. Okay, in the intestine, they are converted into retinal esters and transported through circulation and lymphatic system because why lymphatic? Because a major absorption channel is through chylomicrons. That's how fat is absorbed in the intestine. Now, this retinal ester will go to liver where, and liver will convert retinal esters back to retinol. So, retinal ester is the storage form and whenever retinoids are required, the liver will convert retinal ester to retinol. This retinol will bind to retinal binding proteins, go inside the blood plasma and travel towards target tissues. For dermatology, this target cell is majorly skin and immune cells. Okay, skin and immune cells like T cells, natural killer cells and all. Okay, and after reaching the target cells, this retinol, is converted to retinal and this retinal is converted to 13 cis which is isotretinoin or all trans retinoic acid like tretinoin and then these two will attach to CRABP2 goes to the nucleus retinoic acid response elements gene protein let me write it here okay so they will attach 13 cis retinoic acid and all trans retinoic acid will bind to cytosolic retinoic acid binding protein okay go to nucleus attach to rare which are present on gene leading to transcription of various proteins and this leads to function various physiological function okay so here we have discussed what happens to uh, what happens to retinoids when we ingest them till they reach their target tissue so we have discussed uh, in detail about the different mechanism of action of retinoids their uh, major actions their anti-inflammatory actions their anti uh, not anti-aging slow aging actions increase collagen production now we'll discuss their uses and very quickly we'll be uh, easily able to go through the uses part okay now in uses we'll will be very very short we won't spend much time because we'll discuss them in detail while discussing individual retinoids you just have to remember that there are uh, there are only four sorry three approved fda indications one is psoriasis 
in which we use acetretin. Other is isotretinoin for acne vulgaris, and third is bexarotene for mycosis fungoides. There are only three FDA approved indication as of now for retinoids. The combination therapy is also approved, but we are just talking about retinoids, not combination. Okay, just remember this. Use this part we're going to do uh, in very detail while discussing each and individual retinoids. Other disorders which are not FDA approved include follicular disorders, disorders of keratinization like diarrheas, PRP, ichthyosis, keratodermas, chemo prevention of malignancies, other inflammatory disorders like lupus erythematosus, lichen planus, all of them uh, as in more of uh, more like retinoids are used as an anti-inflammatory drug. Okay, in these kind of disorders. So these are just uh, these are non-FDA approved indications of retinoids. Okay, let's move forward. So, very quickly, we'll go through in each and individual uses of psoriasis. We'll discuss them in detail while we are discussing individual retinoids. For example, since for, for psoriasis, acetretin is preferred. Okay, acetretin has shown to be very, very beneficial psoriasis when used in higher doses, like 50 to 75 milligram a day. Response starts in 4 to 6 weeks, but complete response might take 3 to 4 months to happen. And it has been said that acid threatened decreases the intensity of psoriasis, but the body surface area remains somewhat same. Okay, so it might take weeks to months for proper clinical benefit to occur. It is found to be better than methotrexate and cyclosporin, and taper up doses are better. That means you gradually increase the doses, let it let it maintain in a plateau phase while the response is happening, and then taper down and maintain on a very low dose. Other thing is known as Repuva. Repuva is nothing but retinoids plus Puva or Sorolin plus UVA therapy. Okay. So retinoids plus Puva is Repuva. In Repuva, you have to start retinoids two weeks before Puva to prevent photocamerization. Okay. For example, in psoriasis, you would want to prevent cognorization due to sunlight. So you start retinoids first. And then after two weeks, you start sorolin induced PUVA. Sorry, sorolin and PUVA. Okay. And what is the advantage? Lower doses of retinoids are required because you're using two different modalities to treat psoriasis. Lower exposure to UV light, uh, UV rays, because you're using two different processes to treat psoriasis. So there is less photo damage. So low dose of retinoids, less side effects, low UV radiation, less photo damage. Clear? That is the benefit of the PUVA. We'll discuss the PUVA in detail while discussing acetretin. Third is sequential therapy in which you use a fast acting drug like cyclosporin, gets good response in psoriasis and then maintain on retinoids for a longer duration, low dose retinoids for longer duration. Retinoids are not immunosuppressive, so they become ideal agents to be used with biologicals. That is why a lot of study has been done for combining acetretin with the uh, itanercept and other biologicals. It has been done, good assays are there. So it is, they are very ideal to combine with biologicals because they are not immunosuppressive. In acne, isocretinoid is the only FDA approved drug for severe recalcitrant nodular acne. And the doses that we use is roughly about 0.1 to 0.5 mg per kg for a longer duration. Remember that there are higher relapse rate with lower doses. That is why doses of 2 mg per kg once a day for 4 months has also been advocated. But it's quite very high in my personal opinion. It's better to use a lower dose for a longer time. The cumulative dose. Now this we are talking about cumulative dose. That means total dose. Cumulative dose. Cumulative dose uh, says that in, in, uh, in a certain... Uh, amount of time while you're giving isotretinoin, it is recommended not to exceed 120 milligram per kg. This is the maximum limit. Okay. But it has been found that if the upper doses are used, higher doses are used, you have less relapses. So patients with 220 milligram per kg had lesser relapses. But it's it is always recommended to use a lower threshold of 120 milligram per kg. Acetretinoin is a very good drug in acne. About 70% of patients have good amount of uh, success with acne. 
And initially, there are exacerbations with isotretinoin. It's very common to see exacerbations with isotretinoin. But eventually, the patients do have a good outcome. So, you, so they require a proper hand holding and proper counseling in the initial stages of relapse, uh, initial stages of exacerbation. In CCCS, mycosis fungoid or surgery syndrome, the approved drug is bexarotene. It received approval in 1999, okay, FDA approval, and the dosage is about 300 milligram per meter square. Response rate is seen in 48% of patients, okay. And the main mechanism of action is apoptosis of malignant T cells and normalization of cell turnover in malignancy. We'll discuss this in very um, much detail while discussing bexarotene and the third generation retinoids. Adverse effects. So we'll go through the important adverse effects quickly and uh, in detail we'll study while we're discussing individual retinoids. It will be easier for you to understand why these certain side effects are happening. Now we know the mechanism of action of retinoids. We know the normal physiology of vitamin A. It will be very easy to understand what are the side effects and when you know what are the side effects, it will be easy to understand the monitoring guidelines of isotretinoin, what all things you have to look forward. Now, contraindications, the most important contraindication is pregnancy followed by lactation. So, pregnancy category X, contraindicated, you cannot give retinoids during pregnancy. Other contraindications include hypersensitivity to acid retin or other retinoids or any components of formulation. The warning is that women of childbearing potential must follow all elements of eye pledge. Now, what exactly is eye pledge? We'll discuss in detail while discussing isotretinoin. But eye pledge is essentially a program in which you have to register your patients who are going to take isotretinoin. The eye pledge makes sure that the patient knows the associated side effects. And eye pledge regularly monitors the patient for side effects of isotretinoin and counsels them regarding contraceptive measures. Okay. Other contraindications include teratogenicity, very important, retinoid embryopathy, metabolic like hyperlipidemia, liver damage, musculoskeletal like myopathy, arthralgia is very important. I had one patient who developed uh, muscle damage on doses as low as 10 milligram per day. And I remember the patient telling me that she always had these kind of issues previously while taking isotretinoin from some other dermatologist. But I thought, thought that I'll start with a lower dose, 10 milligram. But even 10 milligram led to severe pain, making them making her uh, routine difficult. Neutropenia is also reported. So uh, and uh, pseudotumor cerebri very important while discussing isotretinoin. Okay. Uh, suicide, uh, sorry, depression, psychosis, all of this self-harm behavior is also there. Uh, pancreatitis, inflammatory bowel disease, this has been disproven but it's just mentioned. Hair loss, these are important side effects of isotretinoin. It's a category X drug, I'm repeating again, completely contraindicated in the newer rating for pregnancy. So now we have discussed the side effects of isotretinoin we know why these side effects occur we'll just discuss one one two two points each uh, about important very very important side effects of retinoids for teratogenicity it causes retinoid embryopathy these are defects in cranium and face cvs defects thymic abnormalities cns malformations okay these are these are the components of retinoid embryopathy Mostly it occurs when the exposure is there in first trimester, which is very risky. Why it is risky? For example, if a person finds out that they are pregnant while they were on isotretinoin, they, they, will, even, they will of course be in their first trimester, isn't it? First trimester, okay. So that's how they're going to be, they're going to come to you that, uh, doctor, I've been taking isotretinoin, but now I found out that I am pregnant. So the exposure is in first trimester. The chances of retinoid embryopathy does increase. We'll discuss that in detail while discussing isotretinoin. About one third of cases have found to result in spontaneous abortions. There are increased chances of stillbirth and there is no safe minimal dose for use during pregnancy. That is why it is completely contraindicated in pregnancy. 
Remember, thalidomide is also contraindicated. Even a small amount of thalidomide, single thalidomide can cause uh, cause uh, focomelia and other disorders. There is no minimal dose uh, of isotretinoin, but most of the time, if the patient is taking isotretinoin, finds that they are pregnant, and you stop isotretinoin, the child is uh, more or less safe. There's no issues have been found. Now, if you have just very low dose, that does not mean that you prescribe low dose during pregnancy. No, that is not allowed. Stop isotretinoin in pregnancy. We have we have discussed not discussed i have told you in date in a small summary what is i pledge campaign you register the patient the patient will be continuously monitored by the i pledge campaign and they will be counseled all the educational and teaching stuff will be told to them what to do what not to do but essentially remember that there cannot be any pregnancy at the onset of therapy with isotretinoin, not during the therapy of isotretinoin, and not for some time after. This time varies from one month to six months in various literature, but we'll discuss what should be the time of, uh, of safe period after stopping isotretinoin. The drug even drug essentially is removed from the body after the after one month, but there are some mentions of no pregnancy till six months after taking the last dose. Isotretinoin is negligible in male ejaculate. So males who are on retinoid therapy are safe. There is no pregnancy issues uh, regarding uh, if the male is taking isotretinoin. Issues arise when the female is taking Okay, so that is important to understand and counsel your male patients who have isotretinoin and have read on the internet that it's a category extra. Remember to counsel them that the chances of any issues happening to the baby is negligible because there is not enough isotretinoin in the male ejaculate. Lipidemia or hyperlipidemia is most common lab abnormality for with retinoids it's reversible you stop retinoids and in about one to one and a half months the lipid levels start to normalize lipidemia is most uh, lipidemia is most severe with bexarotene okay about 80 percent increase in triglyceride and cholesterol that means 80 percent of patients will have increased triglycerides and cholesterol okay other retinoids like isotretinoid, etretinate, acetretin, they increased uh, increased in triglyceride seen in about 50% of patients, cholesterol about 30% of patients. You have increased blood lipids. An important point to understand is we cannot combine gemfibrosil, which is a lipid lowering agent, with bexarotene. Why? Because gem fibrosil is a CYP enzyme inhibitor and CYP enzyme inhibitor is responsible for metabolism of bexarotene, metabolism bexarotene. So if this enzyme is inhibited by gem fibrosil, bexarotene will not be metabolized. It will increase in concentration leading to further increased lipids. Okay. So you have a patient which has increased lipids, you and on bexarotene, you cannot use gem fibrosil. It's better to use statins. So the advice to be given is lifestyle modification in the earlier milder stages with or without statins and other lipid lowering agents. That's why the that's how the advice is given. If the triglyceride levels exceed 500 milligram per deciliter, it's better to stop the drug. Okay. There's no point in going beyond 500 milligram per deciliter. It, this, this is intense hyperlipidemia. So let's just stop the drug and look for other therapeutic modalities. Now, depression has found to be reported more with isotretinoid. It's reversible when the doses are stopped. Other uh, conditions like psychosis and rarely cell form ideations have been reported with isotretinoin, but no direct link has been established in waste literature. It's better that you take proper history, be vigilant and consult a psychiatrist if that is required. Keep on asking questions about mood uh, when discussing uh, isotretinoin with your patients on subsequent follow-up visit. Remember that acne itself is a risk factor. What do you mean by that? That psychological issues can arise because of intense severe acne. And if you give isotretinoin, the acne will improve and the patient's mood will also improve. So remember that acne itself is a factor which can confound your finding of uh, Psycho psychological issues with isotretinoin. So in that cases, when the clinician thinks 
that the psychological issues are because of acne, it's better to give isocretinoin. Okay, but be vigilant. Keep talking to your patient. Consult a psychiatrist if you think that that is causing issues to the patient. There's no shame in discussing cases with other departments. Okay. No defect. Now, chronic vitamin A toxicity causes diffuse interstitial skeletal hyperostosis or DISH. It's a very important side effect of retinoids. Other issues like premature epiphyseal closures or lower bone mineral density have been reported. However, lower bone mineral density or osteoporosis, the good link has not been established, but literature does mention that as a bone side effect of retinoids. This side effect is duration and dose related. For example, high dose systemic retinoids, if given for long periods of time, do impart a risk of hyperostosis or DISH. If DISH happens on certain areas, like in posterior longitudinal ligament, it can lead to spinal cord compression with neurological deficits. So remember, what all areas uh, are affected by DISH? If it if it affects an uh, important area, then you can have severe side effects with DISH. The premature epiphyseal closures are rare, so but we need to examine if there are any uh, issues of bone pains on isotretinoin, get an x-ray done. Okay, get an x-ray done and find out what exactly is happening. Now, um, the ocular side effects include blepharoconjunctivitis, majorly because of decreased meibomian gland oil secretion, and this leads to dry eyes. So, you need to tell your patients that the eyes might feel dry or give them uh, artificial, te artificial tears for management of dry eyes. Corneal opacities can be there, but these are incidental findings, they do not impact the vision. Decreased night vision have been reported by isotretinoin, which is kind of counterintuitive uh, because uh, night vision is impacted by vitamin A deficiency. But if you're giving retinoids, it can also be a side effect of vitamin A retinoids. Okay. Bacterial conjunctivitis is very common and has been reported by isotretinoin. More or less, the eye side effects, apart from dry eyes, is very uncommon. Other side effects include uh, thyroid hormone decrease, which is mostly seen with bexarotene. About 80% population can have decreased thyroid hormone levels, decreased TSH, T3, T4. So you need to have a baseline thyroid level if you're suspecting a patient who might be suffering from thyroid issues before starting isotretinoin. Or after starting isotretinoin, you have features of thyroid issues. So, decrease of TSH, T3, T4 is a feature of central hypothyroidism. Okay. So, we must be very careful about looking at these kind of symptoms. In CNS, the important side effect is pseudotumor cerebri and it has been found when you use isotretinoin with tetracyclines. So most of the time, we are very fond of combining doxycycline with isotretinoin, but pseudotumor cerebri is a known side effect when using these two drugs. I personally use these two drugs because they are very effective together. But I do ask or ask for any transient headache or vomiting or any, any kind of issues which might point me towards pseudotumor cerebri and I can take care of it. Muscles like myalgia, about 15% of patients have myalgias and they are more common in people who are into gymming and working out. Okay, so if you are going to destroy your muscle by going to gym and working out so that they are formed and you have good amount of muscle mass, the myalgias become much more common while taking isotretinoin. Okay, so you have to be very careful. Sometimes a patient will come who has taken anabolic steroids while working out and now they have acne and you want to give isotretinoin to treat that acne. Remember that they will not stop gymming and there will be increased chances of myalgia. So make sure you consult the patient regarding that. Isotretinoin can also cause telogen effluvium, but that is reversible. Increased nail fragility has been reported, and there is a report, report of reversible leukopenia, mainly neutropenia. And this has been reported with bexarotene. Remember, bexarotene is a, is a retinoid used in CTCL, 
So in blood will have a, a van abnormality. So leukopenia and neutropenia is seen. These are some drug interactions, but the important one are with tetracycline, doxycycline, minocycline because they can cause pseudotumor cerebri. Other important is erythromycin, clarithromycin, azithromycin because these are CYP3F4 inhibitors, so they will increase the retinal drug levels. And these are drugs which we usually use in acne. Okay, we use azithromycin, is it? We use doxycycline, minocycline. Cyclosporin toxicity can occur. Methotrexate uh, can increase the levels of acid retin. So these are not good drug to combine in psoriasis. Alcohol. Alcohol is very important because alcohol can convert acid retin to atretinate. Atretinate. Okay, alcohol can convert acid retin to atretinate and atretinate has a very very long T half ranging in months to years and if you are using a molecule which is teratogenic in nature you want to use a molecule which has very low half life so that it gets quickly excreted from the body. So what happens if you start a patient on acid retin and they take alcohol? Chances of acetretin to convert into atretinate is there and if it gets atretinate, it will get stored inside the fatty tissues and the half-life will range in months and years and the person cannot get pregnant during that time or there will be a risk of teratogenicity. That is very important. That is why you have to say no to alcohol if the patient is female and not acetretin. Okay. Males are somewhat safer because there is negligible retinoids in ejaculate. So these are some lower risk drug interactions with the rifampin, rifabutin, rifapentin. Remember, the rifampicin is notorious as a CYP3F4 inducer. Okay. So monitoring. Monitoring is not that difficult to understand if you know the adverse effects and the mechanism of action of retinoids. Okay. You have to take a careful history and examination, identify any risk of specific toxicities and document of the medication what the, your patient is currently on. Okay. Serum or unit pregnancy tests have to be done in women of childbearing age. When we'll discuss eye pledge, uh, we'll discuss how frequently they have to be done and what to be what to be done if the menstrual cycles are irregular. So how to how to take care of that. Okay. Otherwise, not specifically, special tests are baseline x-rays of wrist, ankles, if there's any pain, ophthalmic examination, if there's any issues of uh, vision or cataract or retinopathy or excessive dry eye, okay? Blood investigation includes CBC, LFT, lipid profiles, KFTs, and uh, okay? Just regular monitoring, okay? At baseline, before starting, as you recognize, but the most important is contraception. That is important. Two different methods. Two different. If you use barrier plus hormone, okay, or barrier plus IUCD, okay, that's how you're supposed to use uh, two different modes of contraception while on isoprotein. On follow up, you do clinical evaluation monthly for the first three to six months, then every three months where you assess the improvement, increase or decrease doses, physical examination, ask about mood disorders and everything. Same is done for lab investigation monthly for the first three to six months, then every three months. And they include CBC, LFT, lipid profile, KFT, serum or pregnancy test, test because you have to uh, make sure that the person is not at all pregnant even after a few months of stopping the drug. Excess if there's any pain, ophthalmic examination if any eye complaint. Okay, just remember monthly for three to six months. And then three monthly. Okay, just remember this. Okay, so with that, we have finished this very long lecture on introduction to retinoids. We have discussed the overlapping features of different retinoids. We have discussed the mechanism of action, structure, vitamin A, physiology of retinoids and vitamin A, uses of vitamin A and retinoids, just the basic concept, and adverse effects of retinoids. We will discuss each of these uses and adverse effects while discussing each and individual retinoids. For example, acne will be discussed in a bit detail while discussing acetretinoin. 
so assets will be discussed in uh, asset retain or repova ctcl will be discussed in dexarotene so this kind of uh, i have decided to separate these things out in individual retinoids so that we can discuss in detail uh, so that everything is present in one place and uh, in in uh, four or five videos we'll finish the whole discussion about retinoids and you will need not worry about using retinoids in your patients personally uh, i don't use retinoids uh, systemic retinoids that much for acne they are not my go to drug they are not my first choice drugs but if the patient warrants a use of retinoids i do give it and i do use the doses of uh, 0.1 to 0.2 mg per kg they are they work very good but they have their share of important side effects and we need to know about them they are very good drug but they are risky also so uh, this is a good article on mechanism of, of action this is a good article on transport if you want to learn more about anti cancer mechanism of action of retinoids i have not covered that uh, here we'll cover them in bexarotene video this is a good article current and future potential roles if you want that you should go through each of these articles these are very good articles okay and this is the chapter reference for wolverton but if you go through this video in one hour you'll be easily able to understand and uh, I, I will put different chapter markers in the description so that you can come back and revise if you want so with that we finish our discussion on introduction to retinoids remember that this is just an introduction there will be subsequent videos uh, of uh, isotretinoin tretinoin acid retin uh, bexarotene triferrotene if the time permits and if you want a separate discussion on fourth generation retinoids so i won't take much time give me suggestions any other doubts any other important piece of information that i have left out you want to include write them in the comment section till then we have started our discussion on retinoids i hope to continue it for a few more weeks and then we can easily switch to some other uh, discussion till then adios bye bye and enjoy your weekend